Hi, welcome to Office Hours. My name is Patrick Curran, and along with Dan Bauer, we make up Curran Bauer Analytics. In this episode of Office Hours, I want to wrap up our discussion of the structural equation model. In prior episodes, we've talked about path analysis, factor analysis, the full SEM, how to evaluate model fit. And in this episode, I'd like to wrap up with a quick discussion of a variety of topics that might arise in your own work. We don't have time to delve into each one in a lot of detail, but what I'd like to do is address the, the topic, describe what the issues are, and then give a few sites citations in the text that go along with the video that give you further readings if you might be interested. So these are all kind of modular. Each topic is separate from the other, and they're not ordered in any particular way. Uh, they're just issues that might come up in your own work. So to begin with, I'd like to briefly talk about the assumptions that underlie uh, normal theory maximum likelihood. So we've talked briefly in prior episodes about how once we define our model and establish it's identified, we have to estimate the model parameters from the sample data that we have. And we haven't talked in detail about what the maximum likelihood estimator is doing. That's kind of the gold standard for uh, model estimation and SEMs in most applications. A key assumption of the maximum likelihood estimator is the dependent variables are continuous and normally distributed. Now, technically, that assumption is based on the residuals because it's on the dependent variable side, but often we talk about the distributions of the observed variables. But just keep in mind that the actual assumption is on the residuals. What's important to realize, and this is a point of common misunderstanding in SEMs, we make no assumptions about the distribution of the predictor variables. So we've referred to those as exogenous variables in our, our path diagrams and in the models we've developed in earlier episodes. And all that means is they're not written as functions of other variables. They're independent variables or predictor variables. We only make assumptions about the distribution of the dependent variables or the endogenous. Now what that assumption is, is a rather strong one, is the residuals are continuously distributed and are normally distributed. So what that means is, I'm not very good at drawing normal distributions, but we've all been exposed to this in some way, is we have a distribution that in some way is defined by a mean, and we can say we have some standard deviation, say sigma, and it's unimodal and symmetric, right? A symmetric distribution you can fold over on itself, and it'll perfectly match up. And what's often described of how you describe a, a normal distribution is it can be entirely captured in the first two moments. All right? What that means is the first moment is the mean, the second moment is the standard deviation or the variance. And so what that means is if I tell you that a variable is normally distributed, if I give you the mean and I give you the standard deviation, that's all the information that you need in order to draw what the distribution is. And once we have that distribution, then we can find areas under the curve, right? We can integrate it up to a point, we can integrate it after a point, we can integrate the middle part of it, say 95%, where 5% is on the outside, right? We know what the characteristics of this distribution are. And the SEM, and a lot of models in general, but just focusing on the SEM with more normal theory maximum likelihood, assumes that all of our dependent variables are continuous and normally distributed. Well, what if they're not? All right, so I study uh, drug and alcohol use in children and adolescents, and virtually nothing I study is normally distributed. So let's say that we have something like this, all right? So this is a positively skewed distribution. Now, if I give you the mean and the variance of this distribution, you actually can't replicate that. You can't tell me what it looks like based just on the mean and the variance because I need what are called higher order moments to define that. So if I didn't show you what it was and I said the mean is five and the variance is two, describe that dis distribution, you couldn't give me that because I haven't given you enough information. What I need to do is give you the third and the fourth 
order moments, which are skewness and kurtosis. If I gave you the skewness and kurtosis, then we could start to replicate this more complicated distribution. Skewness is the extent to which a tail is drawn one way or the other. Kurtosis is the thickness of the tails relative to a normal. So are they more thick or less thick? All right, so the problem with maximum likelihood is if this distribution holds, but we assume it's normally distributed, we haven't given the model enough information to give us the correct results in our, our, our model estimates. What we find under non-normal distributions is our parameter estimates themselves are what are called consistent. All right, so there, there are three key characteristics of estimators, bias, consistency, and efficiency. Consistency is as sample size gets larger, the sample estimate goes to the population value. This is a very important uh, characteristic of an estimator. So what's really cool is if we have continuity, that means a lot of, of measures that we observed, a lot of distinction in our numerical values, but it's not normally distributed, the parameter estimates themselves are consistent. We can still interpret those. Our standard errors are incorrect and our test statistics are incorrect. And this is a big problem. The standard errors are too small. What that means is our, our p-values are too small. The critical ratios are too large. We're more likely to make a type one error. That is to say there's an effect when there's really not one, all right? And then our test statistic is too big, which means we're more likely to reject our model than we otherwise should. So there are two ways that we can handle this. The first is to draw on this characteristic of consistency, all right? So when we estimate maximum likelihood using whatever program you're using, those point estimates, the parameter estimate of the regression coefficient or the factor loading or the factor variance, on average, those are interpretable. What we need to do is correct the standard errors and the test statistics for the non-normality. And how we go about doing that is use what are sometimes called robust methods. So there's robust maximum likelihood. These go by a number of different names. You have robust standard errors, um, sandwich standard errors, they're sometimes called, or a sandwich estimator. Um, very important early contributions were made by Albert Satora and Peter Bentler. They're sometimes called Satora Bentler uh, chi square statistics. Um, and in some programs, it might be referred to as just MLR, robust maximum likelihood. What this does is it gives you back the usual maximum likelihood uh, parameter estimate, but it corrects the standard error for non-normality. It pushes it up a little bit to correct for that fact that the estimate is too small. So that's called robust method. So we could have a robust, say, maximum likelihood. The other is to give up maximum likelihood estimate entirely and choose an estimator that doesn't make the assumption. So right, what we're trying to do is fix maximum likelihood for violating that assumption. And what we can do instead is to say, well, let's just take a completely different estimator that doesn't have that same assumption. And one that's becoming increasingly uh, used in, in certain applications is called two-stage least squares. And this goes back many, many decades, but Ken Bolin has made some really important contributions to the development and application of this method. And the way that it's done, I'm not gonna go into details, we could talk for several hours just about this, but the way that it's calculated is it is asymptotically distribution free. So it doesn't even make assumptions about uh, the distribution, the shape or the form of the distribution. So that's generally how we handle if you have a dependent variable that's non-normally distributed, but it's still approximately continuous. That is, we have a lot of numerical observations across the number line for whatever it is we're studying. But things get trickier when we start to lose continuity, all right? So again, something that I study is in substance use is we might have something where I ask, you know, pre-teens, so 10, 11, 12 year olds, in the last seven days, how many times have you gotten drunk? Well, the vast majority are gonna be zero, right? And we might have some small number that are one, and then, you know, a very small number that are two, and then almost no one else. 
all right? Well, not only is this not normally distributed, but it's no longer continuous either. We've now moved to a discrete outcome. That is, it's either zero or one or it's two. We encounter these all the time in the kinds of research that we all do. Symptom counts, number of events, the presence or absence of a, a diagnostic status. So things can be uh, binary or dichotomous or trichotomous or a count. It can be ordinal. It can be a Likert scale. All of these things can come up where we can't make the assumption that the numerical values are across a continuum of potential values. They are discrete. All right. Well, what happens is if we fit maximum likelihood to this that assumes continuity, now that characteristic that our regression parameters, our factor loadings, our other parameter estimates are consistent, we now lose that. All right. And the reason is, is there's no longer a linear relation among the variables is the, the continuity. We can't talk about that. There's a one unit change on X associated with a one unit or a gamma unit change on Y, because now it's bounded between zero and one. It's either a zero or it's a one. And so we start talking about probabilities and we start talking about well, what is the probability of endorsing a particular item given some latent variable or given some predictor. We have to take a completely different approach to that. And these are, instead of non-normal or robust, these are methods for discrete outcomes, all right? So where they take a finite countable uh, uh, value on the dependent variable. Again, keep in mind, because it's really important and a, a, a common source of confusion, predictors are fine. All right, you can have a binary predictor in the model that is biological sex or treatment condition or alcoholism diagnosis. That's fine. The issue arises when you have a binary or a trichotomous or a Likert or an ordinal or a count on the dependent variable set. That's what we have to pay attention to. There is an entire literature on how to handle these. I'm only going to very briefly touch on, on the, the bigger issues at hand. What we have to do is we somehow have to map our predictor variables onto the discrete dependent variables that allows for this nonlinear relation. All right, and there are two ways that we can do that. The first one is called a limited information approach. Okay. This is very popular. I've used this a lot in my own work. There are a lot of uh, uh, positive characteristics of this. And what we do, and it's very cool, and, and again, we could spend a number of hours talking about this, but what this approach says is, all right, I observed a binary outcome. So let's say I'm studying depression, and it's a diagnostic status, zero or one. All right, you're either not depressed or you are depressed. What this does is it says, well, there's an underlying individual continuous propensity to be diagnosed as depressed. All right. So we have some continuous distribution and this is, we're going to call it Y star. It's this underlying distribution, sometimes called a latent distribution. It's normal. It's continuous. And all of us reside somewhere on it. I have a place on it. You have a place on it. Everybody has a, a, a some place on this underlying propensity to be diagnosed, but somewhere is this cutoff. All right, we're going to call that, say, tau. All right, it's a threshold. And if you're below that threshold, then your observed y, notice y star is what we believe to exist but didn't observe. Y is what we did, is if you're below tau, you, are, you receive a zero on the diagnosis. As soon as you move over, then you move to a one. Right? It's like a light switch. It's a trigger. When you cross that threshold, then you move from zero to one. And so the really cool thing, and what we try to do here, is we observed the zeros and ones, but based on that, we want to make an inference about the underlying Y star. Well, why do we do that? The reason is, is we can do this for all possible pairs of variables. All right, so let's say just for simplicity that we have two binary variables. All right, so we can have one that has a continuous normal distribution. We have another that has a continuous normal. There's some tau cutoff 
for the first one, there's some tau for the second one. And notice we have zero and one here, and we have zero and one here. And we have this little two by two contingency tables, all the possible combination of zero and one on the two variables. Well, we can use that to compute what the covariance would be between y star one and y star two had we observed the underlying continuous counterparts. So we take these little bivariate tables and we infer what the covariance is between the two underlying continuous variables. And that's sometimes called a polychoric covariance. Uh, there's specific kinds, there's tetrachoric, polychoric, polyserial. Really, these are just generically talked about as polychoric covariances. What we do is we estimate all of the possible pairs among our variables that we observe, and they don't all have to be both zeros and ones. You can have a binary for one, and you can have some other distribution for another. All right, and so step one is we compute the polychorics. All right, compute, if I could spell, the polychorics. Then, why it's called limited information, that's step one. And then in step two, we fit the SEM to those polychorics. But one of the things I love about statistics is you don't get something for nothing, right? Is you gotta somehow make a concession. You have to somehow how say, all right, I estimated the, the covariances as if I observed the underlying distribution, but I didn't. So there's gotta be a, a penalty for that. Well, what the penalty is, is we can fit the model to the polychorics, but we can't treat them as if we had actually observed them. We have to use a penalty function. It's a different kind of estimation. And most typically, it's called weighted least squares. All right, and again, there's a massive literature on this. I'd give a couple of citations in the text. But what it does is it brings in some degree of imprecision in showing that, that these are estimates from things that we believe to exist but didn't observe, and we can do that through weighted least squares. There are different kinds of weighted least squares. There's fully weighted least squares, diagonally weighted least squares, mean and variance adjusted weighted least squares. That's a very popular one, kind of a robust weighted least squares. And the neat thing is when we do this, we're back in the usual SEM. We get chi-square, RMSEA, fit indices, we get modification indices, and we simply are taking into account that, that we observed these categorical variables, but we're fitting the model to the underlying continuous variables. That's the limited information, all right? The second approach, which is becoming increasingly uh, used in practice is the full information. And what that does is it says, look, we're not going to play this game of this is what I would have had had I observed the underlying. Full information takes what's called the generalized linear modeling approach. And what that does is says, all right, we are going to select what's called a link function, all right, a nonlinear link function that is going to map our dependent variable onto what's called a response distribution, all right? And so what we want to do is fit a model where we have some probability, say, that ranges between 0 and 1, and it's bounded, right? As if we have some, some value of our predictor in the outcome is a probability can't go below zero, it can't go above one. And so what we would do is use, for example, a, for example, excuse me, we would use, for example, um, a logit link function, which is logistic regression, right? It's exactly the same thing, um, with, with a Bernoulli response distribution, right? So we select the link function and the response distribution to be consistent with the characteristics of the, the variable that we observed. So if it's binary, we would have one kind of link function. If it was a, an ordinal variable, if it was a count variable, all of these things we would look toward a zero inflated negative binomial or a zero inflated Poisson distribution. So what is nice about this 
is we're actually fitting a model directly to the native characteristics of the data. If it's binary, we're fitting a model to model probabilities using a nonlinear length function, all right, just as you would in logistic regression. We use full information maximum likelihood, which means there's not this two-step procedure. We don't first get the polychorics and then fit the model. It's all estimated in one shot. And there are advantages and disadvantages to this. Because it's a full information uh, estimator, is this is more efficient. All right, Our standard errors are going to be smaller relative to the limited information. But there are challenges to this. It's very difficult analytically. I won't get into the, the details on this, but we have to do these numerical approximations to very complicated integrals in this model. And not only can they take a very long time to do, but you sometimes can't do them. They're not possible to estimate. Um, and then, oddly, if you're a multi-level modeler, you're used to this. But in the SEM, when we use this full information approach, we don't get all of our usual test statistics. We don't get a chi-square. We don't get an RMSEA. We don't get fit indices. We don't get modification indices. And the reason is, is we can't define a saturated model within this approach, and the details of why not aren't important, but we can't uh, uh, obtain a, a saturated model, and so we can't say our chi-square is this and our RMSEA is that. But what we can do is use the log likelihood that we get from the full information estimator and uh, use likelihood ratio tests to compare competing models. And so we can build a series of nested models and say that based on the LRTs, we believe this one is the optimal fitting model. What Dan and I do in our own work is we actually will often use both approaches is these are asymptotically equivalent. So at an infinite sample size and when we meet other assumptions, they give you the same results, but they start to differ in sample characteristics. And there are some things that I haven't raised in here as limited information. You start to run into trouble with missing data, or if you have cells in those contingency tables that have no observations or missing observations. And so there are pros and cons to the use of those. What I think is important to realize here is because these discrete methods are becoming more commonly accessible and available in almost any SEM package, it's no longer acceptable in grant applications or journal articles to say uh, it, it's too complex, we're just going to assume they're normal and correct standard errors. A reviewer is going to come back and say these techniques are readily available and these need to be used here. So I would recommend if you have binary trichotomous count kind of data that you consider these approaches. All right, the third topic, and again, these are kind of randomly ordered, is what's called subgroup heterogeneity. All right. What is that? Hetero, first let me spell it. Heterogeneity. All right, we'll go with that. Subgroup heterogeneity is just a long mouthful for multiple groups. All right, that's what often we run into. So let's say, I'm just going to make it up, we have a, a simple SEM. We've got three indicators on one factor. We have four, five, six. We have three indicators on a second factor. All right. This is A to 1, this is A to 2, we have some covariance, right? We talked about these, these are residual variances, factor loadings, the covariance between the two factors. In everything we've talked about up till now, we've assumed that the data have been randomly sampled from a single homogeneous population. What that means is there's random variability associated with the individuals from which the population has been drawn, but that, and this is the kicker, these values, these factor loadings, the lambdas, the, the variances of the latent variables, the size, the covariance here between psi 2 and 1, those values are equal on average for all the individuals in the population. All right, Those are equal for boys and girls. They're equal for those in the treatment group and the non-treatment group, All right, the control group. The factor loading, let's say we get a factor loading of 0.71. That represents 0.71 for boys, girls treated control as a function of ethnicity, as a function of age, any individual difference. Those are, are assumed to be equal. What if they're not? All right, what if we're studying children and we're looking at depression and anxiety and half the sample are boys and half the sample are girls? 
Well, we know, both theoretically and empirically, that boys and girls express depression and anxiety differently. All right, and I won't get into the details of that. It's really interesting. Uh, uh, it's a really interesting topic of study. But this factor loading, when we assume there's a single group equals 0.7, right? Say 0.71. But maybe for girls, it equals 0.9. And for boys, it equals 0.4, all right? So there's an interaction between the factor loading and gender. That's heterogeneity, subgroup heterogeneity. So the major way that we can approach this in the SEM is we do what's called a multiple group analysis. So we define the model in boys and girls simultaneously. This is really important to understand. We don't do boys alone and girls alone. We do it simultaneously. We estimate this model in boys, we estimate this model in girls. There's estimated separately but simultaneously. And then we can impose equality constraints across the parameters and conduct likelihood ratio tests to see if those parameters want to be equal or if they want to take on different values. So what we might find is we estimate this, equate the factor loadings for boys and girls to be equal, allow them to take on different values, and the model is significantly improved in fit, all right? So we get these differences in, in the factor loadings. And there's a whole area of research on, on doing this. And I find this, the more I work with these models in practice, the more important I think these kinds of approaches are because it becomes more and more difficult to defend that every parameter in the model is equal for everybody in the sample, is that there may well be important differences as a function of these uh, subgroup membership. All right, now that's observed subgroup heterogeneity. We know who are boys, we know who are girls. There's a whole nother area of study that is fascinating, and Dan is uh, uh, quite an expert on this, and Dan and Doug Steinle teach an entire five-day workshop on this, and that is unobserved subgroup heterogeneity. All right, so that is, let's say you have a sample of 500 people and we estimate some factor model. I won't even draw it out, just picture in your mind's eye. We estimate some factor model, and you believe there to be subgroups within your sample for whom the factor model works differently, but we didn't observe subgroup membership. They're latent groups, so it's latent subgroup heterogeneity. That brings us into the very broad topic of mixture models, latent class analysis, latent profile analysis. And uh, going way back historically, cluster analysis is what we're trying to do is look at the patterns and characteristics of data within the sample and see if there's, there's evidence that would support that for one subgroup, this particular model holds. For another subgroup, this model holds. But we didn't observe those subgroups. We're going to probabilistically uh, infer their existence based on the characteristics of the data. And so that's latent subgroup heterogeneity. And again, sometimes you'll, you'll get the term mixture modeling, finite mixture modeling, latent class analysis. All of those generally re refer to uh, that. How do you recover groups from data? The last topic I'm going to address is how can we use structural equation models to analyze repeated measures data, or what's sometimes called longitudinal data. All right, this is becoming increasingly important in uh, social, behavioral, health sciences uh, literature. Just as I said earlier, where it's becoming less and less acceptable to ignore having a discrete dependent variable, a counter, a binary, or an ordinal variable. It's becoming increasingly uh, less acceptable to have uh, cross-sectional data. Of course, there are situations where that's important and it's applied and it's very useful, but it's becoming more and more common to see repeated measures data. And one of the key advantages of this, there are many, many advantages, but one of the key ones is introducing some temporal uh, precedent in the data. So teleport back to the path analysis episode where I built a model where we had stress and it predicted negative affect and it predicted substance use. All right, now I'm drawing it in a little bit of a funny way at an angle. You'll see why in just a second. The example that I gave assumed that it was cross-sectional data. 
We went into a kid's home, we interviewed the kid, we have them report on their stress, their negative affect, their substance use, and we developed this model because theory hypothesized that was the order, that stress leads to negative affect leads to substance use. But that's an arbitrary order because we don't have temporal precedence in this. It's based on theory. It could be reversed. They could not be causally related to one another at all. We don't know. If we have repeated measures data, say we have stress at time one, but we have stress at two and stress at three, we have negative affect at time one, two, and three, and we have substance use at time one and two and three, now we've introduced temporal precedence. We can look at stress at one predicting two to three, negative affect. These are sometimes called stability coefficients or autoregressive parameters. Substance use, all right, we'll co-vary these as exogenous variables. But what's important is we can do these bi-directional cross lags, all right? And so what we have, there we go, is what is commonly called an autoregressive cross lag design or cross lag panel design. And we have stability, stress one, two to three, negative affect one, two to three. But notice we can now look at stress at time one predicting negative affect at time two predicting substance use at time three, each above their prior values, negative affect predicting negative affect at time two and so on. These are sometimes called residualized change models because we're looking at the relation between stress at time one and negative affect at time two above and beyond negative affect at time one or residualized for. All right, this has a long history in the social sciences. There are a lot of applications where this is perfectly reasonable. However, the last 10 or 20 years has seen more and more concerns expressed about this model and an alternative strategy has been proposed, and it falls under the broad scope of growth modeling, latent curve analysis, latent curve modeling. Um, I have a whole playlist uh, on the same YouTube channel where I talk a, about a lot of different issues in uh, growth modeling. So if you're interested, I'd, I'd suggest you jump over and look at some of those. Very briefly, what growth modeling does is it says, all right, we have time, right? That's our repeated measures. And let's say that we have negative affect on our dependent variable. And you're the interviewer, you go into the home when I'm a kid and you interview me every six months for five repeated measures. We have one, two, three, four, five. All right, now the prior model says, well, on average across the whole sample, does my time one, predict my time two, does time two predict time three, and so on, just like I just I, I described. What the growth model does is says, I am going to use those repeated assessments to define an underlying trajectory. It's going to be defined by an intercept at beta naught, that's the start of the trajectory. It's going to have some slope, beta one. All right, that's mine. Right? I have my individual intercept and my own individual slope. We do this for every kid in the sample. You have a trajectory, every kid in the sample has a trajectory, and we can gather these all together, all right? So what do we have? We're gonna have some average trajectory for all the kids, so we could call this say mu beta naught and mu beta one, but we have individual variability. So what's the variance of the intercepts around that mean value? What's the variability of the slopes? Or is there kid-to-kid -kid differences in the starting value? And then a really interesting question is, is there individual variability in the rate of change over time? Do some kids increase more rapidly, less rapidly, some kids go down, and so on. And so this is the, the foundation of the growth model. And as I describe in these other videos, is we can define those means and variances within the SEM. So let's say we have negative affect at one and two and three. I'll just do four because I'm out of room. And I'll put rectangles around them because those are observed variables, all right? And we can estimate an underlying latent factor. Let's call it, say, eta sub alpha that we define to be the intercept. We define some underlying 
second latent factor that's the slope. And in these other videos I describe, we set these all to one and we set these to one, two, and three. There's a whole variety of things we can do. Each latent factor has a variance. Each latent factor has a mean. The means capture the average growth. What is the starting point of negative affect? Where does it go over time? How does it change? Here I've done linear, we can have non-linear, we can have piecewise linear, we can do all sorts of cool things with that. But each also has a variance, and that represents the individual variability in that parameter. So larger variances would suggest that there's lots of kid-to-kid -kid variability in starting point and rate of change. Well, if we have a lot of variability, what we then might be interested in doing is saying, well, we have COA status. Remember, child of an alcoholic. We have biological sex. We have some ethnicity variable, whatever we might have. We can use those to predict the intercept and the slope and start to say, are there differences in boys and girls in the starting point and rate of change of negative affect? And we could even use the uh, uh, intercept and slope factors to predict some distal outcome measures. We can do growth in two or three or four constructs at the same time. We can do growth within the multiple group framework that I just described. There are a whole variety of interesting things we can do here. And those are just two examples of how we can use the uh, uh, SEM for repeated measures data. And we can also expand the factor analysis model where we look, does the structure of a construct change systematically over time? So looking at depression in children and looking at age six, eight, 10, 12, does the very expression of depressive symptomatology change as, as a child ages and so on? They're really just an infinite number of interesting questions that we can ask. So I'm going to stop there in terms of the survey of advanced topics. And so we talked about where we have a continuous dependent variable that's non-normal. Then at some point, we can't even assume continuity and it becomes discrete. And how do we handle that? And then what if we have subgroup heterogeneity, if we observed it or if it was latent? And then all of that and everything we've talked to up to this point, we could bring to bear on repeated measures and say, how can we model stability and change in, in repeated observations over time? So I hope that's been of some use, and as always, thank you very much for your time.